All right, Fund Management Nation, let's get started today with a little bit of operational contract support instruction here. Should be an interesting class. Uh, one thing I do want everybody to kind of do is uh, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, and state your name. Know nothing about operational contract support. And I will not be an expert. But after this class, I will know more than I know now. And will know who to talk to when I need help. That's kind of the first thing you need to understand about the operational contract support is very complex. It's very different than what you're normally used to operating with in the military. So let's get into it and see some of the differences and let's uh, learn a little bit to make our management a little bit easier. These are the objectives we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at uh, what commanders, the execs, and CORs, and all the key players, what y'all need to understand as you're doing that. Uh, it'll tie in a little bit with unit budgets. We won't so much get into that today, more in the fiscal stewardship budget management class, but we will talk about the requirements package and what you need to come up with as far as funds. We'll talk about organizations that you can go to for help with operational contract support that are out there to help you and more than happy to do it, very competent people. Look a little bit about planning and management for contractor services and contingent operations because if you get planning and management is your responsibility. And so we've got to, and you got to get ahead of that. And we'll look at a few legal issues and concerns that you have to deal with with the OCS. And uh, of course, this will tie into our next class on fiscal stewardship. So, what is OCS? You'll notice it is a lot of people will say it's operational contracting support. And that is not correct. It's operational contract support, and it is how we use contracts as a vehicle to get um, and obtain any supplies and services and construction from commercial sources, from private companies, in support of whatever our requirements are. And it is a framework of three different functions, and it's joint responsibility between you, the operational unit that's requiring this function, the support, and the contracting organization. So what are they? Contract support integration, that is you planning and coordinating, synchronizing contracts into, contract and support into your military operations. That's pretty obvious. And then the other is contract management, what the oversight and integration of contract personnel and their equipment in support of military operations. Make sure they're performing the right job, getting them into the timelines. Those are your responsibilities as a requirement organization. Then there's contracting support, which is in the middle, but I put it there specifically as the last one coming up because that's the contracting organizations, the 51 Charlies, of the world to go out and help into enter into a legally binding contract with a company to provide a support you need. That's the contracting piece, that legal vehicle to um, get that support. Some general principles that are out there from JP40. We're always going to have contractors. Just get over it. Whether you like it or not, they're here to stay because of many reasons we don't need to get into here. Most of our joint operations are going to have significant contract and support uh, for technical issues predominantly. Uh, command authority does not equal contracting authority. We'll get into that later in the brief, but just because you're the, the senior military person or the commander doesn't mean you have certain authorities over contractors. Contracting is also not just for logistics support. Most of it probably is, but you'll see contract and support out there for interpreters, for intel collection, for runway operations, uh, staffing, planning, you name it. There's tons of different aspects to get contracted out. You've got to work on contracting early in the process. What are you going to need in the future? Because it takes time. Just like if I need, if I'm going to need a unit to build a bridge in eight months, I need to be working with the with the army and the joint staff and sending out requests for forces to get that unit mobilized and deployed to where I am, so I can get that bridge built. And it is a significant challenge when you're doing crisis action planning in major operations, and it requires a significant lot of planning. We don't do a lot of OCS planning and training uh, in our training. And so it's just one of the things you got to worry about. But these are some general principles. We're always going to have them. Some principles, they're not part of your form of military chain of command. So you've got to understand that. However, you do have authority over them for matters of force protection, security, and safety. Uh, they'll have di They potentially can have different legal statuses. Uh, there are discipline and commander's authority challenges. You know, you just can't discipline a uh, contractor for for many things. So you always need to be able to talk to your 
and have a relationship with your legal office, your security folks, as well as your contracting officer. And you just can't tell a contractor to do something else unless it's in their contract. They're really limited. And contracting planning will cross many functional areas. If I know we're going to have a 1,000 contractors, uh, the accountability folks need to know about that. The food service needs to um, planners need to know about that. Housing planners, security. A lot of folks need to know, the organizations need to understand what's going on with planning and management of contractors. So, so there are five phases in the management process. First, you got to plan for them. Uh, all the O plans uh, should be already looking forward to if we execute this, what government furnished support do we need to provide? Is it going to be medical? Are we going to provide housing? Are we, are we going to provide food, et cetera? And, in, and how many contractors are we going to need so that we can plan for it? They're pre-deployment. They have to have theater security clearances. What required training will be needed, required shots, et cetera. Generally, pre-deployment is all done by the company themselves. They will come through um, a joint reception center. It has to be designated, uh, entered into SPOT ES, which we'll talk about in your readings. That's a tracking system for contractors, so we know how many are, how many are on which contract and where they're located. And they're going to be using the same lines of communication that the military operations are. So it has to be planned and coordinated. Theater management in theater is a day-to-day support and rules of engagement for the conduct of contractors. What are they doing? How are they going to enter on base? Where are they going to eat? Uh, how are we going to keep track of them? What what are their tasks for the days? And what projects do they have to have? What are the timelines? And finally, once their contract is over or the operation is over, redeployment. Planning for that change over ahead of time, terminating the contract, make sure bills are submitted, and then getting all the people and equipment out of country back to wherever. Uh, that's not necessarily a government responsibility, but you know, action to execute. That's the, on the contract to do it, but we are responsible to make sure that is done properly as well as getting any equipment back that we loan them. OCS is an operational event. Uh, don't think, but oh, you're just going to pass this off to the contracting folks and let them deal with it. That is totally incom- incorrect. The requirements generation, you'll you'll see down in here, a lot of different people are involved in this process. And don't worry about this maze of charts and lines and, and blocks in here. That's that's okay. But there are a lot of people from the warfighter, whoever that requiring activity is, to the finance organization is going to be paying this and fund certification and payment to the contracting office who has to go out and develop the contract, do source selections, have the boards, as well as the contractor. And oh, by the way, none of these people work for each other. They're all working for different organizations, have different equities. So it's really a coalition of the willing to make this happen. And that's just by design. Okay, got it. It's different than what everybody else is used to. A lot of times, uh, young field grades, etc., say, "Hey, if I own, if they're here, I own them, and I'm the boss, and you got to do exactly what I say." And nine, that doesn't work that way here. But if you think about um, the operation as an OCS planning and execution as an operational event, look at it in terms of the MDMP. The requirements generation. What am I going to need contractors to do? Is really mission analysis, and then after that, you do a commander's back brief. So, boss, here's here's what we know about our requirements and all of our um, facts and assumptions. That's one friction point where a lot of things can break down. So you have to have that commander's back brief as you're going through the process, keeping the commanders and staff involved. Then you develop different courses of action and different types of contracts, um, vendors, bidding, and what they can and can't do in cost. That's really core development selection. Uh, now, the contract award is done by the contracting officer, but the organization requiring the service is involved. Okay, and that gives a friction point, too, because now things are going to – they're going to start deploying in. you got to have everything organized to receive the, the contractors, and then they're going to start executing. Well, that's the operations of, of the op order. Okay, they're operating. That's where we'll be doing contract administration. Is everybody showing up? Are we doing our inspections to make sure we're getting the quality and timeline of the contract? And then when we close the mission down and get ready to do that, that's another friction point. And then you have re- uh, redeploy and recovery from an operation. Now then, that is basically contract closeout. So that's just another way to look at it, but it's got to be with commanders involved. They just can't. Commanders should not delegate 
or abrogate their responsibility. This is no different than if I needed an engineer battalion to come and work for a brigade to build a bridge. That battalion is working for that brigade commander. The contractors are working for that commander to execute a mission. It's no different except for the authorities that that contractor has or the commander has over the contractors. So be thinking about OCS as an operational event, not just as something to pass off to a, your four or your S4 or somebody. There's a different authority structure within OCS. There are two lines of authority. The first one is the contracting authority, and then there's the requirements, planning, and oversight um, authorities that you have. So let's look at these right quick. For contracting, uh, it all comes from the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology that authorizes Army Acquisition Command and others to obligate and in funds for the government as well as enter into legally binding contracts. And that goes down through this lane here. Okay, And then there's the command authority that Army Materiel Command has over Army Contracting Command. That's for Title 10 for train, readiness, oversight, and those types of Title 10 functions. Then Army Contracting Command delegates down to contracting support brigades, battalions, and con contracting debts to physically write contracts for uh, the requiring activity, which is the other side over here, is the requirements, planning, and oversight from the COCOM down through the ASCC down to the cores, divisions, and BCTs, and, and many others, I just don't want to complicate the chart here, that have requirements for contracts. These units, these contracting units here are so aligned to support. So a contracting support brigade is aligned to an Army Service Component Command. The contracting battalions can be aligned to divisions and ESCs, Expeditionary Sustainment Commands, or whoever is needed for it. And then these contracting detachments, you may hear them called contingency contracting teams. That was the older term. Uh, doctrine just changed. But those can be aligned to support BCTs or caches or med brigades or sustainment brigades. So those are smaller teams that can go out and write contracts, generally for theater contracts. Okay. Down here, you'll see the, the Army G4 is responsible for writing policy. DCAA, the Defense Contract audit agency sorry they audit contracts at big levels you'll probably never be involved with them before and make sure the payments paperwork is right before payment and dcma the defense contract management agency they are responsible for large contracts think log cap think um large acquisition future vertical lift the the joint strike fighter uh, long-range precision fires those big contracts that that a, a dod enters into Okay, so again, two different types of authority. There's the green suit, Title 10 command authority, and then there's contracting authority. And all these units that have requirements, they provide the COR, the uh, contracting officer representative, and they do the planning and management of contractors while they're in theater doing the job that, that they've asked for. So what are some types of contracted support? Uh, first one is theater support. Those are written in theater wherever you are to do certain things. Such as, and they're generally low level. Base cleaning, um, latrine contracts, gravel, furniture, local needs for just um, you know temporary or long term, just basic levels here. Okay. A next one can be is system support. That is more technical. Those are things if you've seen contractors working on aviation or uh, military intel collection or signal support or air defense, some weapon systems. That is generally what we're talking about here. And then you have external support. That is where the contract is written outside of theater, generally for worldwide, to support theater requirements. That could be log cap. Log cap is written out of Army contracting command um, and or sorry, out of Army Sustainment Command at um, Rock Island, Illinois. Transportation contracts can be written you know, in, in the states. Interpreters are all written out of the uh, INSCOM at Fort Belvoir. They own the worldwide interpreters contract. Foods written out of D is by DLA. 
So those are just some of the different types of contracts that can be written. And different people write them, different organizations. When you need a contract, you're going to have to come up with requirements documents and a requirements packet. More of these can be found on these in uh, ATP 4-10. But generally speaking, these are the generic requirements for a uh, requirements board. Each ASCC or command may, may be a little different, but this is what you're going to have to have. It kind of makes sense. What's, what's the independent government estimate of how much this is going to cost? The requirement owner, the unit, say the BCT or the division comes up with that. Why do you need this as opposed to military? Some statement of work that is of what the contract contractors going to have to do. A legal review by your own legal for to make sure that it, it meets all the legal requirements. Money PRNC is basically a a check for a certain amount that you can pay for whatever this requirement is you want to pay for. Cost benefit analysis, COR nomination to make sure you've got somebody trained that's going to oversee it. A draft quality assurance surveillance plan. It's basically a checklist of what they're going to do and any government property that's going to be provided to the contractor. So it's really a detailed packet. If you'd ever need to do one, you just get with the contracting agency and your G8. So somebody there has got drafts of it. But these are general requirements. And again, there's more on those in ATP 410. And all of this to put together is the responsibility of the requiring activity. Again, if if a BCT needs some type of contract to support, somebody, some uniform person is going to put that together, not the contracting agency. So what's the requirements process? Uh, it's, a long, it's, it, it's a timeline. It doesn't have to be long, but the unit uh, develops the requirements documents we just talked about. They nominate a COR. The, the commander nominates it. Then it goes to some type of validation board. Generally, the G4 is doing that, but it could be the G3. doesn't really matter. Then resource manager has to check it out, say, yep, there's enough money, uh, enough funds available to do it. And those are generally part of the, uh, the uh, Army Requirements Board that's held by the unit. The contracting will then happen where the contracting officer writes the contract, sends it out for bids, um, and works with the unit on the best type of contract to get, and they'll award a contract. All those involve unit in, involvement. The vendor will accept the contract. They'll deploy over, and the unit will provide COR for on-site management. There are a lot of other steps that are provided. Most of the time, you'll never be involved with them, but that's then how the bills are paid based on what work that the, organ that the contracting company is being done. The point, the key takeaway here is unit involvement is important, you know, up through when the vendor gets the contract and is going to be deploying, okay, because you've got to tell them what requirements. So there's a lot of unit involvement here, uh, and you can't just pawn it off to the G4 or the G8 to handle everything. Some key relationships, it all starts with the COR, the contracting officer representative. They're nominated by the unit commander, whoever he or she is, nominates them. But the contracting officer, because of, quote, contracting authority, appoints the COR on orders. Uh, the COR reports to the contracting officer on matters of performance. COR also reports to the commander on mission accomplishment. A COR may not be an expert. You, know, you could have a signal officer um, overseeing a minor construction project, and that's fine. But then that the commander owes a subject matter expert to help that COR who may be familiar with construction standards or whatever, maintenance, etc. The COR needs to be a good manager, does not, have, does not necessarily have to be a technical expert. But if not, the commander owes a good subject matter expert to the COR. The KO has a contracting, uh, enters a contractual obligation with a company, a private company, who then appoints some site lead to work with the KO, or and they report to the contracting company, which makes sense, and then they'll coordinate and work with the COR on site for matters for matters of uh, contractor performance and standards. And then the KO will provide the contract to the COR so that the COR can um, 
work with the QASP, update it, the, the quality assurance surveillance plan, and manage that supervisor or manage that uh, contract. And, that, and that's what the QASP is for, is to evaluate the work of the – and then all the items are pulled out of the uh, contract. If you've gone to a, a restroom somewhere, some public facility, sometimes you'll see a big checklist there before you walk out the door. That's a QASP. Somebody goes in and says, yes, somebody's cleaning this all to st- all of these you know, nine or ten step standards. Same type thing. Or if you take your car to a uh, you know, a dealership. They'll have a 36-point inspection where they've gone and checked everything off. Okay, And then the contractors will use the performance work statement from the contract itself to conduct their work. So be careful what you ask for the PWS or the statement of work, what you write, because that's what the contract is going to use. It can be modified, but it takes the KO to modify it, the contracting officer. All right, so... You're a leader. You want to appoint a COR. There's certain things you should do to support your COR. Don't just say, hey, you know, Lieutenant Smith, you're the COR. Good luck. You know, don't screw this up. You need to provide the proper training. Underwrite honest mistakes that they are going to make. They all do, and that's fine. Just don't flame them because they make an honest mistake. You got to provide some resources like equipment, space, time, a subject matter expert, COTR. I didn't update, but that's the old term. Uh, a subject matter expert to help that um, COR if they're not a technical expert. You should have specific time on the calendar in certain meetings for updates. Have those CORs brief contracts and what's going on. It's not an out of sight, out of mind, fire and forget missile. It is a part of your mission. That's why you asked for it. And you have to support when there's conflicts between the commander and the KO. The commander wants something done. The KO has got to do it, but it takes time or needs legal reviews. And it's just there There are going to be conflicts. You've got to be in between those. You've got to support the COR who's in between a rock and a hard place. They have certain responsibilities to the KO, and the, the commander is probably their raider or senior raider. And the contracting officer should provide the contract to the COR. I have heard too many CORs say that, oh, we never saw the contractor. I never saw it. And why is unfathomable? You just didn't push it. You are you are able to get a cop. There's nothing secret about these contracts. Some are secret, but you can still get it because you're in the organization that required it. So it's not a problem. But there's no there's nothing prohibiting the requiring activity to get a copy of the contract. So get a copy and read it. And the COR should also have it. Organizations that can help you in theater, of course, you've got the as a field grade, as a major or an NCO listening to this, go to the contracting support brigade, count, find your counterpart, whoever he or she is, develop that relationship, take them some cupcakes. You know, management by cupcakes would be a good book to write sometime, but just go by and see them, establish that relationship to call, see if you have problems. Or the contracting battalion, uh, find out where they are. Uh, make those relationships again. They have the organizations that write contracts for you, or the contracting debts. You know, invite that debt to your meetings. Invite that debt to your um, hails and farewells, uh, organizational days. Uh, you know, again, go by and see them with cupcakes and just establish relationships because they're going to be supporting you, and you want to have those relationships. The Army Field Support Brigade does not write contracts. They have a log cap representative within the area of operations, but they can find you the program managers or the CORs for all the system contracts. So if you've got problems with aviation, signal electronics, weapon systems, they can find out who that contracting officer is because they have ties back to the life cycle management centers who most likely wrote those contracts. And then the theater sustainment cell can help find other contracts in theater. They have a list of all the contracts and can say, oh, you need a contract for gravel? Well, here's this other unit that's got a contract. Do you want to glean on with them or write your own? And um, maybe you can modify it, et cetera. But they can do a lot of help with you as far as uh, looking for other contracts in theater. So those are just some of the five. You could read more about those in uh, ATP 410. Some legal considerations. Uh, again, you don't have the same legal authority over contractors approved to accompany the force, that's CAF, as you do with military personnel. You need to work 
be always in contact with your legal office, contracting officer, and COR before you make decisions because there's a lot of factors that if you're thinking, oh, this applies to them because they're here, you're probably wrong. Uh, there's lots of U.S. laws, that's a force agreements, local nation host laws that you just don't understand, and that's perfectly fine. You don't have to. You don't need to. You've got a legal office and a contracting officer who can help sort you through any legal issues. Okay, uh, The UCMJ does apply, but um, it's only for big issues. Okay, You're not going to be able to do a, a night court Article 15 on a contractor for stealing a CD out of the PX. If he's stealing a CD, he got bigger issues. But you know what I'm saying? That's a minor thing. You, you're you just not going to be able to do that. Those are – UCMJ is generally reserved for crimes against others, you know, assaults, murders, injuries, those types of, you know, horrible things. Uh, so whenever you have doubt about legal issues and whenever you're talking about contracts, you need to have a legal rep there and the contracting officer or the assistant contracting officer in the room. Yeah, you just and the CUR. You're just better off having those meetings with those folks and having a good, maybe a routine meeting with them all the time. Just how how are things going? What questions do you have? Build relationships as well. Some differences between contractors: uh, you cannot inspect them as part of your command supply or maintenance uh, discipline program. Uh, you just can't. Uh, it's not part of the contract, and the only people who can inspect are the COR and the KO. Okay, uh, I had to cease fire. I had to call uh, call out one of my de- our, our brigade deputy one time. He wanted to send uh, inspectors down to my site. I said, "No, you can't do it," and I had to prove him wrong. But uh, you just can't do it. You know, so we got the COR to come over or to do an inspection for the brigade uh, because they don't follow the same rules. Uh, you have to check um, on supply is different. Government furnished property remains on your property book, but it's transferred as part of the contract to the contractor. You don't give them a hand receipt or a 3161. It stays on the government property book. Flipples are not done on contracted equipment by the unit. The con- you report it to the contracting officer who then does a flipple and it does the investigation. Uh, whenever you have government furnished property that's signed out, you don't – have as part of your of your hundred percent, your change of command, your ten percent inventories. If you want to see it, you just contact the CUR or the KO and say, "Hey, we want to come over and take a look at it, see how it's looking." Okay, and there's other parts of the contract that you have to think about when you're writing those when you're giving contracts. So that's just some examples of how certain processes are different with contractors versus military, and the same goes with maintenance. How you can do uh, readiness reporting on it? Who's going to provide the repair parts? Um, the COR should be ensuring that the equipment is working, but if it's not, it has to be swapped out. That's a supply transaction. You just don't take bumper number 101 and swap it out with bumper number 102. There's a, there's a contract modification that has to happen. Uh, so just there's different things. If you're thinking, oh, well, this is how we do it in the Army. That's how they do it. You are wrong. You have to talk with the contracting officer, uh, the COR, to find out what the changes are and the differences are. And let's kind of wrap things up here with ethical climate. Uh, ethics is a big issue and fiscal stewardship. And here's kind of some different ways to uh, work on an, establishing a better ethical climate. Have proper training of all of your contracting personnel, who are your CORs, your subject matter experts, anybody that's going to be involved in it. Check two-person validation of receipts to prevent fraud. In other words, if you've got a delivery of you know, a thousand cases of bottled water coming in. Have two people go out and check to make sure it's two. It's, it's a thousand cases. There are a lot of incidents for fraud were occurred where deliveries were not made, but one person signed off on the receipt. Review timelines to to prevent waste. An example would be: you need to have a crane move something. You need to rent a crane for a week. That's great. When are you going to need the crane? What day? Have it delivered that day or the day before, not a week before, and now you're now you're paying for two weeks worth of crane. Okay, so you just now granted things change. I'm not saying that, but you re, you look at the requirements timelines uh, to prevent that. And when do you when do you need them? When you when when is the service to be terminated? Leaders taking the online uh, OCS courses or BCOR certified is an excellent idea. 
I was made to go when I was a battalion commander. I did not understand it at first. I thought it was a waste of time. But once I took the course and went back and was working with my CORs, I understood the value of me knowing what they were talking about. Uh, not doing, not being trained in what your CORs are doing is like having a battalion commander who's never gone through gunnery on weapon system. It, it makes no sense. So I would highly encourage that. You can review the CORs periodic reports as their boss. You can't change anything, but you can look. So, okay, I see that. Here's what the um, here's what the uh, COR is doing. Here's what the company's doing. I had that when I was uh, in an organization. Had some contractors, and I read the report, and it said that uh, you know we reviewed 36 regulations this week, or something like that. I forget what it was, or did. 13 reports. I forget the exact thing. I said, okay, well, what were those reports? And they couldn't give me a list. I said, okay, next time I want this report to say itemize those out because otherwise you're just writing a data point, okay? And I want to be able to see that. So you can review them. You can't tell them to change. Oh, it's not 37, it's 15, or you can't say this. Just got to be careful with that, but talk to the C the KO and the COR. Recognize outstanding performance. People like to be recognized. They like to be given things for their hard work. So recognize them, you know, the during whatever meetings. Hey, look, COR here found something, and we were able to save $1,000. So everybody clap for Staff Sergeant Green. Uh, you can um, inspect the COR to make sure they're doing proper management techniques. They've got their QASP. They're doing their checks. They've got their, uh, their you know, whatever they need to be doing. And never, ever meet with contractors without having your KO, COR, or legal there. Uh, it avoids unauthorized commitments, and it makes sure there's no misunderstanding between the commander and contractors. And there's others out there, but those are some of the, kind of the big ones. These are some tips that uh, I picked up over the years and were given by uh, somebody at DOD. Um, again, be familiar with the process, which you should be able to take from this video as well as ATP 410. Prioritize your requirements. Look at other aspects first. Can you do these, instead of doing contracting, can you do organic assets? The supply system. Uh, can host nation or coalition forces do this work? Integrate often. Have a good relationship or uh, integrate often with your planning and what, what you're going to need in the future. Develop a good relationship with that contracting commander or whoever, you know, that NCO or that staff officer, whoever it is you need to go work with. Read the contracts, make sure you understand them, make sure the QASP accurately reflects what they're supposed to be doing, hold them accountable. Appoint quality CORs, which is very hard. Uh, I'm not saying that's the easiest thing to do. The old saying is, if Major Smith is, the, is it's if it's going to hurt to appoint Captain Smith to be the COR, then Captain Smith's the right person. But that is very hard to do. Sometimes it's not always your best uh, staff officer. But you've got to support that COR. You got to train them. You got to give them the ability to do their job. But you know, provide bounding overwatch as needed. Eliminate fraud, waste, and abuse. Avoid any appearance of impropriety. My recommendation to you is never take anything from a contractor, not even a coffee mug. Because if you're sitting there with a coffee mug from Company X and Company Y wins the new contract, and you're drinking from Company X's coffee mug, they're going to think there's a, a uh, some bias or favoritism. So just take nothing from them and never talk to them or do anything without. It sounds wrong. It's not kind of who we are, but that's just the way you need to think. And look out for unauthorized commitments and be involved in planning and supervision as a leader. You don't need to do all of it. That's what you have the COR for. But just like you do checks on range officers before they go execute, you want to do checks on a COR. Just like you do IPRs on operations or planning, you want to do op checks on OCS execution. And these are the key takeaways from the class. There uh, should be no real brilliance down here. You've got to have command involvement. There are different legal concerns you have to worry about, so have that relationship with your contracting team and your legal office. Training is equals uh, helps enable better planning and management. Different appointed people have different responsibilities. OCS is more than logistics, and you have to have the right COR. Uh, but remember, there's two chains of command. There's two levels of authority. There's contracting authority and command authority. And there are a lot of organizations that can help you out. Ask. Do not be afraid to admit you don't know because you don't. And that's okay. And they know you don't know. They want to help you. So go ask those contracting organizations or legal or another COR. Okay? And that's all I have.
I hope that was um, good for you. It wasn't too long. If you have any questions, just shoot me a note. Uh, but I think the readings and other things will help you out in class. So good luck and take care.